Hello, everyone. Thank you very much for your patience. Uh, my name is Jeremy Martel. I'm the Director of Communications with the Cape Breton Partnership. Thank you very much for joining us for the first uh, in our ocean farming series with uh, the Nova Scotia Community College. Um, I just want to give a quick technical uh, update and, and briefing for everyone on how this session works uh, for those of you who aren't uh, used to using the Zoom platform. So as you can see, we're using Zoom on a webinar, which means that the only people that can be seen or heard or have to worry about being on camera are our presenters today. Um, if you are attending, you don't have to worry about if you have to get up and use the bathroom, if you need to grab a drink, if you need to eat your lunch. Uh, we understand you won't be seen, so don't worry about it. Uh, if you do have any questions, you'll see at the bottom of the screen that there's a Q&A tool available to you. Uh, please leave your questions there and we will attempt to answer those when we're able to and or uh, leave them to the end of the session and we'll try to answer them there as well. Um, if you have any comments on the session or anything you'd like to let the panelists know of, you can certainly use the chat as well. We'll be monitoring that. Um, and uh, throughout the session, again, if you have anything at all, just please let us know. We'll, uh, we'll try to add links and information into the chat as we're able as well. Um, today we have folks joining us from a, a, a nice list. Uh, we have people joining from Maine, from Calgary, from Sydney, from Forshu, Gabarus, Petit de Gras, uh, Halifax, Member 2, Niels Harbour, and Jiddick, uh, and beyond those as well. And a special thank you to uh, Professor Martin's Sea Farm Operations class with NSCC who are joining us uh, as a virtual uh, field trip today as well. Uh, thank you very much for allowing the students to join us. Uh, with that, I'd like to hand it over to Amanda Mumberkett, Community Innovation Lead with Nova Scotia Community College, to get us started. Thanks so much, Jeremy. Um, so welcome. Welcome, everyone, to Ocean Farming 101. NSCC is pleased to partner with the Cape Breton Partnership on this exciting new series that will explore sustainable and responsible methods of aquaculture and broaden our thinking about the potential and the responsibilities that come along with that. To begin, uh, we want to acknowledge that we are in Mi'kmaq, the unceded and ancestral homeland of the Mi'kmaq Nation. Our relationship is based on a series of peace and friendship treaties between the Mi'kmaq Nation and the Crown dating back to 1725. In Nova Scotia, we recognize that we are all treaty people. Through this series, we'll be discussing topics that take a deep dive into food security, environmental sustainability, pathways to entry, innovation, readiness, quality, and capacity as re it relates to ocean farming. We've assembled some of the most knowledgeable people in the sector from all across the province and beyond, uh, including today's keynote. Our future sessions will follow a panel format that will include time for viewers to ask questions to our experts. So watch for upcoming sessions being launched soon. NSCC is committed to supporting the workforce development and training needs of our industry partners in Nova Scotia. We do that by offering relevant training opportunities, such as our Oceans Resources, Fisheries and Aquaculture Program, uh, through our applied research labs and scientists, and also through timely and responsive customized learning for industry. And in doing so, we are building Nova Scotia's economy and quality of life through education and innovation. So with that, I'll hand things over to Tyler Mathis, Acting CEO of the Cape Breton Partnership, to introduce today's keynote. Over to you, Tyler. Hi, thanks so much, uh, Amanda. Um, my name is Tyler Mathis. I'm Acting President and CEO of the Cape Breton Partnership. Thanks for joining us today, and I, I'll, I'll thank uh, Amanda as well, our partners at Nova Scotia Community College, um, friends in industry, academia, and all those who are interested in learning more. Uh, we're Glad to have you here and to, to learn together. Uh, the fishing industry and ocean economy are important parts of our culture uh, here in Cape Breton, in Nova Scotia, and in the, the whole eastern seaboard. It's an industry that's provided livelihoods, food security, stability, and it has and continues to produce some of the highest quality products in the world. I commend all who have worked or work now in the, that industry. Um, we, uh, it's because of that success that uh, we are able to be here today to, to build off of that success and look to the future. That future is full of untapped potential right here in our region. And in order to continue the success, uh, innovation, sustainability, and community impact are on top of mind for all of our stakeholders. Uh, we hope that this series will provoke productive conversations on how we can work with our partners to learn from each other, remove barriers to sustainable growth, 
and help ensure the fishing and sea farming industry in Cape Breton and Umagi continues on its trajectory of sustainable development and innovation. Um, I'll point out specifically, uh, Amanda Mamercat, Community Innovation Lead, has gone above and beyond to help us uh, put this together today. And NSCC is an is a awesome partner. And also, our partners and friends in the Indigenous communities of Member 2, Eskazoni, Wigogama, Bodledek, Wagmancook, and the five municipalities on our island, the town of Port Hawkesbury, the counties of Victoria, Inverness, and Richmond, and the Cape Breton Regional Municipality, all allow us to provide uh, learning just like this, along with the province of Nova Scotia. And now, I'd like to introduce you to Dana Morse, who we're all here to hear from. Uh, Dana is an extension uh, associate for the Maine Sea Grant College Program and the University of Maine Cooperative Extension. His work as an extension agent involves a mixture of educational programming, technology, technolo technology transfer, and applied research. Most of his work in recent years focuses on shellfish aquaculture through touching on culture of other marine although he touches on the culture of other marine organisms such as seaweeds and American eel. Dane has been active in the intersection between commercial fishing and aquaculture and in developing approaches that maximize the integration of these industries, help diversify the options for fishers, and works to ensure continued prosperity of coastal communities. Uh, he serves as a technical resource for shellfish producers, fishers, scientists, regulators, and others. In short, Dana serves to communicate science-based information on marine issues to those stakeholders who need that information. He's been on the job for 22 years and enjoys it as much as the first day. Um, although he tells us that he's, if he's up, if he finds a job that includes fly fishing, surfing, or donut taste testing, he's gone. So when he comes here to Cape Breton, we have an itinerary for him and we're hoping that he stays. But until that day comes, we're happy to hear from him virtually. So welcome, Dana. <laughs> and thank you. Um, I was uh, sitting here listening to the, the my self introduction there and I caused myself to smile. <laughs> so thank you so much. Uh, it's a real pleasure to be here. Um, yeah, my name is Dana Morris. I work for uh, both the University of Maine Sea Grant Program and University of Maine Cooperative Extension. Um, I am one of those lucky people who absolutely adores uh, their jobs. Um, I started in 1998 and it's true. I I enjoy this work as much as I did uh, the first day and um, the sorts of things that I get to do, the people that I get to work with um, and the type of subjects I get to engage with. Um, they just feel good uh, and refreshing and energizing all the time. Um, and this is part of it. Um, I'll tell you that uh, I have learned personally and uh, in Maine, we've benefited a lot uh, particularly from uh, scientists in the Canadian provinces. Uh, and so there's a debt of gratitude that uh, I'm very happy to hopefully uh, be able to repay a little bit here. Um, I am going to try to start to share my screen here. Um, and I hope it will work. Um, and we are seeing your presentation. Oh, good. I was going to ask if you would mention that. Now, I will say that um, I can't see you, but I'm keeping an eyeball on the chat screen. Um, and people are welcome to unmute and interrupt me at any time. I'm not what you'd call a very formal guy. So if there's something that you'd like to stop on for a little bit, I'm, I'm happy to dive into that. Um, and I, as I understood my assignment, I would like to to give you some of the high level or broad scale things that I think are relevant with respect to aquaculture, um, but also to dive into some of the particulars. Um, and I'll also say that I'm, I'm going to do my best to not try to kill you all by slideshow, uh, by PowerPoint. Uh, I think I've got about 25 or 30 minutes worth of material here, and then uh, really hoping that we can use the remainder of the discussion for a Q and A. Um, so let's see here. Did my slide advance? It sure did. 
Okay, great, thanks. So just a very quick uh, bit about me and us. Um, the Maine Sea Grant part Program is part of the National Sea Grant Program, um, which has 32 programs around the United States, including Puerto Rico and Guam. Um, we are spread out along the entire coast, as you can see there in that graphic. Uh, and I've got uh, colleagues who do everything from beach monitoring to water quality to anadromous fish restoration. Um, and it's a real pleasure of the job that I can call my colleagues in California or Wisconsin or Texas um, and ask them for their expertise. So the network in total is a really powerful resource to, for people. Um, let's see here. So why aquaculture, I guess I'm saying. Um, and the issues that I've got listed out here apply on a global scale and the local scale. And, and you can read them for yourselves. They're probably fairly familiar topics. Um, in Maine, certainly um, the diversification for the working waterfront is particularly important because um, of the roughly 3,500 miles of coastline that Maine has, less than 20 of those miles are dedicated to working waterfront. Um, so there's that. And we are hugely dependent on a single resource, which is the, uh, the lobster. And so diversification is really important from the working waterfront standpoint, as well as the marine resources standpoint. Um, but it's also important to ask, well, why not aquaculture? Why might you not want to go down this way? Um, and I list some of those items uh, there as well. And again, uh, hopefully these are recognizable or familiar issues. Um, so here's my next slide. And I love to throw this out there, but as a broad, a broad approach, you can probably guess what we're looking at. Um, we're looking at planet Earth here. Um, but if you look towards the top, the top is not north. So what you're looking at there is New Zealand. And then down around at about the four o'clock position, that's Hawaii. Um, and this, of course, is the Pacific Ocean. And so I love this graphic because uh, it gives a pretty stark indication that on this half of the planet, 98%, 99%, whatever that number, it's all water. And then, of course, if we were to rotate this image, you, we'd get the continents in there, but there's a lot of water there. And so when it comes to um, what drives global processes and where we can stand to get our food from, this graphic really kind of hits home for me. And hopefully it's useful for you too. Oh, uh, I see environmental concerns as an argument against, for example. So that came from uh, Claire. Um, so environmental concerns might include transmission of diseases, or overloading of local carrying capacity, for example. Uh, I'll throw those in there and we can talk more about that later. Thank you. Um, so as I, as I understand the, the Cape Breton industry, a uh, little bit of where it has been and where it might be, um, I, I do know that there is uh, industry present, um, but there's also kind of a general sense of what can we do? And I think that's part of the reason why this series is on. Um, and the, I guess the older I get or the more experience I've gotten, I just am more and more enamored of the power of action. Um, and action can certainly go wrong. Things can go pear-shaped quickly if you don't think about it. But on the other hand, these quotes are, are about how other things can uh, emerge out of action that you can't foresee. They just happen. Uh, and sometimes that is a really powerful dynamic. Um, and so this next slide is about that. Um, and so I'll go around the slides here. So for example, at the top right um, are new products that come out. These are from uh, Atlantic Sea Farms. And they're made possible because now we have a, a seaweed farming industry. So there's new product development. Seaweed Week and the main oyster trail on the other side are made possible uh, because we have these emerging industries and these are geared towards tourism and education and the culinary opportunities. Um, and these opportunities did not exist um, 
oh, say seven or eight years ago. The Seaweed Week, I think, is in its fourth year and people come to Portland and they visit shops and they go to stores and they go to restaurants and there's educational programming and it's really cool. Um, sea scallops, and don't get me started on growing sea scallops because I will talk about it all day. Um, sea scallops is a relatively new product here in Maine, both for the adductor mussels and for whole scallops. And again, the, the whole scallop market doesn't really exist in the United States. So the work that we're doing here in the state is literally pioneering stuff for the entire country. Um, and then the two other photos, the teachers up top, that's there at the Darling Center. Uh, and the student who's in the foreground of the center picture is uh, standing next to um, Andrew Peters. Uh, so Andrew is the scallop farmer Strew and Coleman is the recently graduated master's student. Aquaculture has proven to be a very fertile ground for education all the way from K through 12, all the way through PhDs. So these are new, our, our next scientists, our next regulators, our next business people, our next educators. The list of opportunities for basic and applied research using aquaculture is just mind boggling. So all these things emerge um, sort of indirectly because we have um, the aquaculture industry that we do in Maine, which is frankly a pretty diverse one compared to other states. Um, so I'm switching gears now and, and saying, well, there's, there's a lot of beer and Skittles there. There's, there's a lot of opportunity, but that's the, that's the first blush. Then you have to start to get into the real nuts and bolts, which are anything but trivial. And all this list of uh, items and issues that you see, they will all apply and many more. Um, and so a strategy or a plan or even an individual business has to think all these things through before they choose a site, before they choose a species, before they go for financing and all that kind of stuff. Um, and I will say that as a broad question, hopefully this is useful, it might be useful for you to think about What's your vision for your industry? Where would you like it to go? What would you like it to look like? And then to say, well, plan for that and create strategies to make that happen. Uh, and again, I will say that the provinces have a great deal of expertise. I've benefited from it personally and, and lots of people uh, in the Northeast have as well. Um, now you'll notice that I put a little asterisk next to feasible regulatory environment. And that's, definitely an issue that uh, aquaculture has to contend with, but it came up in the earlier discussions when uh, we were preparing for this. Um, and if I understood things right, um, the regulatory environment um, is challenging um, in the provinces there. So I just have a couple of comments and then I'll go through what it's like here in Maine, just as, a, as an example. First of all, regulations are really important they are critical and central. Government can be good. It's popular to frown upon local, state, federal government, but good government is like the best thing. If, if you, for example, if you have worked at a company or have worked at an organization and you just had a wonderful boss, wow, that, that made a difference. Uh, and I can tell you from personal experience, the management at the Sea Grant program where I uh, work, um, has just been wonderful and so empowering. And I've had bad bosses before in other jobs, so I know what the other side looks like. Anyways, so government and regulations are important, but they are not easy. And they really have to balance uh, a difficult suite of responsibility, such as I've got listed there. Um, and from the other side, for businesses to be able to grow and thrive and survive, all these other things have to apply. You have to have some predictability. You have to be able to access those, regu access those regulations, know what they are, talk to knowledgeable people who can decipher them for you and tell you what to do and what not to do. As a business, you need to be able to adapt and evolve and remain competitive and timely in your work. And these things, balancing these responsibilities and uh, having business-friendly or business-useful uh, regulations, these things are almost always intention, and it's always a, a, a tightrope 
Um, and it's just something that, uh, that people need to pay attention to and always be at that table for. Um, in terms of Maine, uh, I'll say that we are a story of adaptive management um, and uh, more recently, a lot of pretty well organized efforts to relieve barriers to entry because our industry is about a hundred million dollars um, and it employs probably 800 to a thousand people on the water. Relatively speaking though, it's still fairly small. Um, our shellfish industry is uh, peanuts compared to down south. And so barriers to entry is still an issue for us. What advice would we have for someone just getting started in the industry? Uh, thanks, Kate. Um, I will hopefully get to that um, and would definitely love to touch on that later on because it's a good question. Um, for, for Maine's case, the first protections emerged in 1849 and Maine used to be a territory of Massachusetts. We gained statehood in 1820. And the 1849 regulations were to protect people who had planted oysters and believe it or not, there were um, there were fines and punishments for poaching those oysters. And if you poached at night, the fines and the penalties were much worse than if you poached by day. So they were really trying to discourage that. Um, so there was some vague precedent way back then, and it didn't happen until all the way in 1973 when Maine first established lease laws, which are granting specific rights to a specific area of publicly held main property. Um, and we had one type of lease up until 1991, at which point the Department of Marine Resources, which is our principal regulatory authority, they established a thing called an experimental lease. Um, and this was a lower barrier of entry mechanism. It had a shorter application period. It was for only three years, only up to four acres. So it kind of helped people get in. Um, and that was in use for a number of years, but there was still some difficulty with that. And so um, we developed a thing called a limited purpose aquaculture license in 2007. It is a license, not a lease, and it only runs for the calendar year. And it's only for 400 square feet. But this has become very popular because it's a very low bar to entry uh, and it really opened up different species. Uh, different areas along the coast so people could experiment. And to tell you how much I know, um, I have been continually surprised at how much good oyster growing area there is in the state. I, I might have said, oh, area X or Y, maybe. And there is a lot more than I suspected. And so this uh, exploration or this prospecting has really paid off. Um, a standard lease has up to a 20 year lease term, which was recently increased from 10 years. A standard lease uh, can be up to 100 acres maximum and uh, a company or an individual can uh, operate and own up to a thousand acres in aggregate. Uh, there is transferability for standard leases as well, which is not the case in every state. Um, the thing that I'll mention here, and we could spend some time on it uh, later on as well, is that uh, the Department of Marine Resources as the principal authority worked very hard to consult with agencies like Coast Guard, uh, US Coast Guard, US Army Corps of Engineers, um, Department of Environmental Protection, uh, US EPA, um, and they have working agreements so that when DMR receives an application, that's one-stop shopping, and the application automatically is consulted uh, or goes out to all those other agencies, and then they get brought in as needed. Uh, other states make you go to Army Corps or go to Coast Guard or go to a state or a municipal authority, um, and it becomes much more fractured. So that's been a very uh, beneficial aspect of uh, sort of life here in Maine. Let's see. Nova Scotia does something very similar. Good to hear. Um, so now I'm just going to dive in a little bit um, to some of the, the species that we have commonly produced. I'm going to touch on a little bit of some species that are uncommonly or starting to emerge. And again, my background is principally shellfish. I've worked a little bit with finfish, a little bit with recirculating, a little bit with um, 
sea vegetables, seaweed. So I'm going to stick principally into my wheelhouse and leave those other things alone. Um, and hopefully this will just be pretty brief. So uh, in terms of Eastern oysters, uh, we have about 120 oyster farms. That number has gone up uh, rapidly in the last seven or eight years. We're still only producing about 14 million pieces. Uh, it is geographically distributed along the state. Again, there, there's been a lot of people trying out different areas, which has worked out pretty well. Uh, it's pretty much all half shell. Uh, it is all hatchery seed. We don't have any productive spat collection here. Um, and we have a, a variety of production systems. And I'll say that oysters and seaweed in particular has really started to attract people from different backgrounds. It used to be, first of all, uh, in the 70s and 80s, people who came out of academia. Then um, we had uh, some people who came from working waterfront backgrounds. Now we have people who want a life on the water. They may have no experience at all. They just know that they are willing to work hard uh, and to try to do something where their life is their job, kind of like fishing and farming, that you can't separate the two. Um, the livelihood of a fisherman is the life of a fisherman, for example. Um, and so in terms of methods for oysters, uh, we do bottom planting. This is one of the more famous boats in Maine, the, the Oyster Girl One for Pemiquid Oyster Company. They're harvesting off a lease. Um, these are oyster grow units. Um, and uh, if you don't know, these were uh, invented right there uh, in Canada by Riel Savoie. So uh, they've made great inroads here. Um, we do have a little bit of intertidal production. Um, this is a flip bag system, and I expect we'll see more of that. Uh, we have a flip farm just as of last year, and this is a New Zealand uh, approach, and we have uh, lots of shellfish grow out bags as well. So those are just a, a few of the typical production systems for oysters. In terms of mussel producers, uh, we have a couple of people who do bottom seeding, uh, one of which is a, a seventh generation uh, Dutch family who moved to Maine specifically to take their family knowledge and to begin uh, bottom seeding uh, muscle production. We have five different uh, raft companies. We used to have one long line producer, uh, but ducks, eider ducks in particular, drove them out of business. There was no way to protect the farm uh, against all that predation. Um, the, the landings are still relatively low. It's all wild seed, but hatchery work is certainly uh, in progress. And what we hear repeatedly is that to make this a, a profitable business, you need scale. Uh, mussels per piece are eight to 10 cents, maybe, um, if that. Uh, and so to make any money, you have to put some uh, product over the wharf. Let's see. And so here are uh, some, just a few shots. There's a mussel raft in the background. And normally there would be a predator net. Um, stretched around the entire perimeter of this raft. And in the foreground, you see um, a socking machine uh, made by the Spanish company uh, Aguin and a sock of, uh, of mussels being produced. This is different than the PEI uh, approach. The mussel socks hanging from these rafts are anywhere from say 40 to 55 feet long. Um, and the seaweed equals sea vegetables equals marine macroalgae. It kind of depends on who you talk to about how they, uh, how they like to talk about this. Um, it's a very much new culture industry, although we have a 40 or a 50 year old well-established wild harvest sector. Uh, we have a rapidly growing number of producers and the landings are going up very high. Uh, we're focused principally on sugar kelp although there have been uh, some studies and, and certainly some grow out work on other species, other varieties of kelp and dulse. Uh, all of the seed is from uh, hatcheries. And as far as growing stuff goes, uh, growing a kelp is pretty easy. Um, the processing and the products are much more difficult. Um, most of the volume is going through one buyer, um, although others are entering. Um, and there is definitely a strong push and an ethic to work with commercial fishermen as the farmers. So here's that integration piece, fishermen, harvesters as farmers. And it works because kelp is a wintertime crop and a lot of, a lot of fishermen will put the gear on the bank. 
uh, or put their boat on the hard, or if their boat's still in the water, they can tend the crop. So they'd seed in October and harvest in March, April, May. Um, and I'll say sort of editorially, where the real money is going to be is in product development. So, uh, and so that's where, that's where things are going to happen. And so here are just a few shots of what the process is like. Um, this is a Korean method where you have strings, uh, and it's a certain kind of string that's usually wrapped around a PVC pipe, uh, and they are seeded with uh, spores from the kelps, uh, fed, given plenty of light, and pretty soon you see these little plants start to show up on your seed strings. And I, I show this uh, kelp farm, farming manual, which is available online. It's a very nice resource. And then pretty soon, uh, what you do is you wrap those seed strings around, say, a half inch piece of pot warp. And uh, if you seed out in uh, October, November, December time, pretty soon your kelp plants grow. Uh, and they do what's called stepping off. They start to grab onto the rope with their hold fast. And pretty soon you get lines of kelp like this. Uh, and so these are, these are some folks from Maine Fresh uh, Sea Farms uh, harvesting some kelp on their work barge. Um, and that's kind of what it is. <clears throat> um, the other, uh, excuse me for a sec. Um, so those are our, our three sort of most commonly cultured species. Um, and a few of the other options that are either under consideration or um, uh, under trials are these right here. So again, uh, scallops are near and dear to my heart. Um, we have been uh, experimenting pretty heavily with the ear hanging technique. Uh, so we've got very strong relationships with the manufacturers in Japan and some of the scientists and fishermen there. Uh, tray culture as well um, is worth experimenting. Uh, I had to give a shout out to Ron Boudreau at Rodney Fougere there, because in my only trip to Cape Breton, they were very welcoming and super helpful. Um, just great guys. Um, and Michelle Terrio as well um, was just wonderful to talk with and learn from. Um, and again, I'm, I'm happy in some small part to try to repay the favor. Um, you might think about infaunal bivalves. And so here I'm thinking about soft shell clams or hard clams, razor clams, that kind of stuff. Uh, I don't know anything about your green crab problem or your milky ribbon worm problem, but this is a plot for soft shell clams here, Maya arenaria. Um, and it's a well-established technique. Uh, it's a difficult one and it doesn't work everywhere. So you do have to do those very site-specific trials um, to see if it's gonna work. Um, we've done some uh, work with razor clams. This is Ensis directus, actually Ensis leii, I think now. Um, and we've been pretty successful in the hatchery, uh, a little bit with the grow out and with any luck, we're gonna be doing more of that work this year. Um, and I think that is my last slide, yeah. So as you, as you go about your uh, efforts here and strategize, um, I think this is what it takes. And, you know, I'm, I'm being a little cute here, but it's a lot of listening. It's a lot of talking um, and it's a lot of thinking. So you got to do that and you have to balance with the, you got to do something. Um, because when I'm talking with producers, for example, the best way to learn is to get cold, wet, dirty, and probably bloody. So um, that's the way you really start to learn stuff. So again, this power in action thing um, is very much a factor. So um, that's all I had for slides. Um, I will, I guess, stop screen sharing now. Um, and I will look up the chat in the Q and A. Um, where, where should I start here? I've lost track. I need a little bit of help. Hello, Dana. Uh, sure, no, no problem. So we currently have two questions in the Q&A and we had an extra one in the chat that I'll find for you. Uh, so first we have a question from uh, Kate who's asking, what advice would you have for someone who is just getting started in the industry? Yeah, um, <laughs> this is gonna sound sarcastic. I don't mean it to get sarcastic, to be sarcastic, start. So talk to people, visit a farm, talk to your regulator, figure out what you would like to grow and how you would like to grow it 
and where you would like to grow. The challenge um, facing new producers is that, at least I think, you're faced with many problems all at the same time. And if, uh, this is probably a bad analogy, but you're solving multiple equations and they're hard to judge against one another. So your first little while is gonna be like blind man's buff. You're gonna be asking questions and not quite sure what your direction is gonna be. Don't fret about that. Don't worry, keep asking, because I think what will happen is over time, some of these things are gonna start to resolve themselves. They'll come into focus and you'll start with asking general questions but as your ideas get more fully formed, that's when you're going to dive in. So if you decide, ah, you know, I, uh, scallops are a little too unknown for me. Um, I don't have the equipment. Maybe uh, I'm better suited for seaweed. Well, that's a decision. Now you can go and talk to Terry Chopin at, in uh, New Brunswick, or you can talk to Steve Backman uh, in St. Stephen, or any of the seaweed people in your area. Now you can start to dig in. Um, and so don't be frustrated or worried if you don't have all the answers uh, set out just yet. Just kind of keep chugging. You'll get there. Next, we have a question from Carl. Uh, and I think this is uh, in reference to um, a part of your presentation, what he had asked. Is there a reason that they only farm hatchery oysters? Are they GMO oysters or is the collection process just an option? Um, the collection uh, process works but very small. We've done um, a very little bit of spat collection. So it's not like going up to Boktouche where they set out the Chinese hats and they just get nailed or out on Cape Cod where their spat collectors and pipes just get covered with spat. Uh, we don't have that density of larvae here. Although, um, and I'll, I'll say this as one of those uh, spin-off benefits, many of the river systems in Maine are now noticing that their oysters are spawning, meaning farmed oysters. That spawn, those recruits are now settling on the shore where they are off the farms. Those now become fair game for capture fishermen. So there are diggers, clam diggers, who are working the shore of the Damariscotta money, of Damariscotta River, making money off of picking up oysters that were spawned off of the oyster farms. And we suspect that mussels and scallops will have this same uh, knock-on effect. So there is a, a benefit to the capture fishery from the aquaculture industry, um, which we count as a good thing. Um, so yeah, we we don't have the we don't have the larval density there, uh, and we do have two commercial hatcheries that are very well regarded and quite expert at what they do. All right. Next, we have a question from Jennifer, uh, wondering if you're dealing with the MSX in oysters in Maine, and if so, and probably the important question, how? Yeah, um, yes, we are. MSX has been present in Maine at least since 1991. That's at least, th that's the first documented case that I can recall, uh, having shown up in the East Coast around 1957. In 2009, the Damariscotta River, where 80 plus percent of the oysters in Maine are uh, grown, uh, had a virulent strain of MSX show up and it wiped out 90% of the oysters. So landings in 2010 were way down, but immediately what happened was the, um, there were biosecurity regulations instituted by the state against the movement of oysters um, and our hatcheries uh, started purchasing uh, selectively bred seed from uh, Rutgers and Virginia Institute of Marine Sciences. So VIMS uh, and Rutgers seed were MSX resistant. Uh, they're not MSX proof, but they can withstand the disease long enough to get to market size. Um, and it's unclear to me about where uh, Atlantic Canada stands in terms of selective breeding. Um, and I see um, uh, Scott has uh, mentioned about triploids. Um, we do have triploids produced in Maine hatcheries and, and Maine growers in my mind are kind of split. Some people really like triploids, some people do not. Um, they have their attributes. Again, it's very grower specific and very site specific. Great. Um, 
from Kate. Do you know roughly um, how much the oyster tourism opportunities contribute to Maine's economy annually? Not yet, but um, I have some anecdotes. Um, the oyster trail was kind of running in the background since 2014, 2015 or so. But some of my colleagues at Sea Grant and the Aquaculture Association really juiced it up this last year. People who started to advertise tours were booked with like for the summer within three weeks. So people are coming from Canada, they're coming from the West Coast, they're coming from the middle of the country. And uh, it was an immediate link to the main office of tourism. Um, and of course, people come to Maine for all kinds of reasons. But if you're coming for the seacoast, a lot of times you're going to want to try every lobster roll you can get your paws on, right? So now, uh, the way that I think about it, um, I'm going to trademark this phrase one day, is that people are going to come to Maine to go on oyster safari. Because oysters in the Dan Riscotta taste different than Casco Bay, taste different from the town of Korea, taste different from Wakeg Neck. And people like to try different oysters. That's part of the thing. So they can stop at all these different locations, get a tour, stop at a, at a restaurant, stop at a retail establishment, visit a farm. Um, they can do all these things. And that means that they're buying gas and staying in uh, B&Bs and all that kind of stuff. So I think it's going to I think it's going to be uh, non-trivial. Thank you. Um, from uh, Aditya, what is the transferability of a standard lease? Uh, they are transferable. Um, and in some cases, let's see here, take this with a grain of salt because um, I'm not the, I'm familiar with them, but I'm not the, the absolute like say so authority on it. Um, I believe in most cases, there is no public hearing necessary. Um, but I think the new applicant um, must demonstrate things like financial capacity, just like a, uh, um, an applicant has to uh, originally. Uh, limited purpose aquaculture licenses are not transferable. And I think that experimental leases are not transferable. And uh, uh, <laughs> Scott uh, has also weighed in uh, in the chat just to mention uh, that uh, Dana is correct, that they are, in fact, uh, transferable. A yeah. uh, question from Jean. Just let me scroll up. Uh, any observations on the restorative aspects of integrated sea farming and speculation of the regulatory and or rulemaking changes to promote the benefits? Yeah, great question. Um, it's a long discussion, but some recent research really uh, pricked my ears up. Uh, so, yes, there's good evidence that IMTA, multitrophic aquaculture, uh, pays benefits. Uh, Cook Aquaculture, whom you're going to be familiar with, operates in Maine. They tried a little bit with mussels and seaweed. They decided, as far as I know, to stick with principal operations. So they're doing job one, grow and fish. Um, other operations like Banks Island Mussels, their principal job is growing mussels, but they're also growing seaweed. They've been part of the scientific uh, end of things. There's a lot of collaborative research that happens here. Um, and lo and behold, uh, kelps around mussel farms seem to stimulate better growth, better shell development. And the recent research was that um, kelps, because of allelopathic um, phenomena and because of nutrient competition, can outcompete at least one toxic algal uh, species, Alexandrium catenella. Um, and so there may be good knock on benefits of growing seaweeds close to shellfish because it will reduce the biotoxin uh, load potentially of other species. This is still new research, so it's yet to be determined, but really intriguing stuff. Um, and as far as regulatory, um, the regulatory system in Maine uh, is quite uh, amenable to that. They guard public health, but that's... Um, covered under their regular uh, protocols, I think. They're great people to work with. Fantastic. Uh, from Andrew, uh, you mentioned product development is likely one of the biggest areas of opportunity, especially in using sea plants. What are emerging trends in product development using these primary products, for example, largely for agri-food production uh, or for end consumer products or uh, for uh, human consumption? Yeah, it's almost all for human consumption right now. I was, I was on a call earlier today where we were kind of discussing this thing. Um, 
and human consumption uh, and even things like beauty products, that's where the dollars are at the moment. So um, our production is still relatively low. So they went for the high value product there to pay for operations and all this kind of stuff and to try to be profitable. As the industry scales, um, I think the current wisdom is that these other aspects, feeds, um, pharmaceuticals, nutraceuticals, extracts, all those things will come more to the fore um, because many of those are higher volume, lower value. Excellent. And, and uh, uh, our friend Scott Sampson has just given us a, a link that I'm going to share in the chat for everyone on licensing leasing as well. Thank you for that one. Um, from Megan, what would be considered a successful harvest volume on the 400 square foot leases that you had mentioned? Anything. <laughs> so it, it's really going to depend. Um, uh, if you are growing oysters, for example, you could stock it with uh, 30,000 oysters to begin with or 40,000, but you're going to run out of space really fast. Um, so if you were having a rotating crop you on that same uh, footprint, you might put in 10,000 because 10,000 oysters is going to take up space in years two and three, and you have to keep your new seed crops going in there. But if you were to harvest five or 10,000 oysters uh, a year off of one LPA, that's good. Um, there have been people who have tried very small muscle rafts uh, that will fit within one LPA, a 20 by 20 foot raft. Um, you might be able to get, oh, I don't know, 5,000 pounds off of that. Um, and then for other organisms like seaweed and sea scops, the numbers are much more variable. Um, A, because seaweed, well, seaweed you can expect to harvest uh, three to seven pounds per linear foot, I'm guessing. So you can kind of figure that out. Uh, and for scallops, again, it, it's so variable, our, our uh, experience is still so new, it's a little bit difficult to speculate there. They are worth doing, however, because the first year that you try growing anything, it's almost entirely about experience. It's almost zero about the dollars and the revenue. You need to see if your site works, if you can work, if the uh, if the animals like to grow there, what the shortcomings are, you got to run into all those problems before you dive in, really. So, um, yeah, sorry, a little digression there. <laughs> oh. <laughs> uh, question from Glenn. Uh, what are the typical capital costs to start up a small size farm in terms of equipment and, and so on? Um, time to cash flow is about two years. What kind of farm are we talking about? Mm. Doesn't, that makes a difference. Okay. Doesn't mention, but I'll tell you what, Glenn, if you can put that in the chat, which one you meant, we'll come back to the question too. Uh, from Lan, uh, when we grow seaweed, can we grow sea urchin at the same time to make the sea urchin grow bigger? And is there anywhere you know that they are growing seaweed and sea urchin? And if so, where? Funny you should say that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm helping out a little bit um, with a project about urchin culture. Um, and... I don't know, except in very, very small trials, like a couple of cages. Um, I don't know of anybody really doing any co-culture of urchins and kelps or other types of seaweed. I think there's a lot of interest there. The, the uh, conventional wisdom tells me that urchin culture from seed to a big muffin um, is not yet economically feasible, although it's uh, biologically feasible. You can do it. Um, and so I think those are still open questions about how that will work. But again, the, the more that we get into this, the more amazed at how much work there is to be done. People are going to be very busy and they're going to have a blast in the next 50 years trying to figure all this stuff out. Right. Uh, question from Michelle, and I think I heard this answer on CBC, so I, I'm interested to, to know more. Um, who is or who could be buying Key Brand seaweed and for what uses? Uh, I don't think I can answer that. So, um, and the reason why is because I don't know your demographic very well. I know here in the U.S. getting people to eat seaweed has been a little bit of a, a struggle. Um, we do have traditional buyers for things like uh, soups or dashi or tea or that kind of stuff. But that's where I say that the, the magic is going to be in product development. So 
Atlantic sea farms, they've, uh, they've got a beet kraut with uh, seaweed in there. My favorite is their sea chi, which is kimchi with kelp. And oh my God, that stuff is delicious. I buy that at the store regularly because I like kimchi. So the people who can figure out these niches are going to go to town, but that's a trick. I have a bit of a, a dual comment from uh, the uh, Sea Farm Operations class. First, they wanted to thank the organizers for putting on the webinar and to thank Dana for the great information. They also wanted to know if they could reach back out to you if they have more questions. Um, they see you as a, a potential fantastic resource for, uh, for their class as well. Yeah, absolutely. I'd love to talk. And, and we will share Dana's uh, uh, contact info later. Uh, the second of that comment, of course, is uh, that uh, Carl from that class, uh, proving how small of a community we have here, just messaged Ron Boudreau and uh, told him that Dana gave him a shout out. And he was quite okay. excited to hello. want to tell you hello. So Dana, hello from Ron. <laughs> All right. That makes my day. <laughs> um, next question from Bruce. Uh, is anyone growing a whole scallop product in pearl nets? Uh, not really. Uh, we've tried pearl nets. Um, they didn't function uh, any better than lantern nets. They didn't function any better than a rigid tray uh, hanging from a long line. And, and incidentally, um, some of the rigid tray work that we're doing right now was inspired by Fermarine du Quebec up in Gaspé. Um, and um, I think there is some promise there. We're continuing to do some research. But pearl nets here even though I've seen them in, in, uh, in play in Japan, um, they're very efficient with them and they've got processes and protocols to make that happen. We haven't really seen the benefit from that yet. Duncan Bates over in uh, Mahone Bay is a, is a guy who I've met and visited and he's got more than his share of experience with Pearl Nets. Great. Uh, another question from, um, and apologies if I'm, if I'm not saying your name right, but uh, from Aditya, uh, is the whole industry capital intensive from the business point of view? And if yes, uh, how about someone who would like to step into the industry as, um, as a fresher or any sort of government aid? Um, again, it depends. If you're going to step into the muscle industry, you're in for it. Because um, again, to be, to be profitable, um, you need capital. And I was talking to a muscle grower today who said, you know, if you really want to do it up as a muscle grower here in Maine, you better start with a million bucks for capital and operating and all that kind of stuff. So there's no joke. Um, if you're going to start an oyster farm, you could start an oyster farm with two, three, four thousand dollars, no problem. And then you can bootstrap it. Um, incidentally, I'm an oyster farmer on the side. And that's how my farm, which is going into its eighth, eighth season, I think. Um, that's how we've done it. Um, Seaweed is a little bit easier, um, assuming that you have the vessel that can manage it and to be out there in the wintertime. Uh, you're talking about some ropes some buoys and some moorings. Um, and again, it's, it's not a uh, huge necessarily go to the bank money, um, but it's, it's not nothing either. So I don't know if that helps at all. Um, can sea kelp from, from this is from uh, Dana, can sea kelp be used to create fabric fibers? Yes, I think you can. Um, I'm no expert. Um, Jacqueline Robidoux is our point person on all things seaweed. Um, she would be a good resource. But again, uh, go to someone like Terry Chopin. Um, the man knows it all. And from Scott, uh, again, uh, he does also agree. Yes, and bioplastics. Um, I'm going to uh, eat this uh, stuff, yeah, <laughs> um, I, I think we're, we're coming close to the end, so, so I'll ask one final question here. And uh, if, if there was any that we missed, we apologize. Um, we will try to uh, get answers for you and reach out via email. But uh, the last question here from Jean, um, any observations uh, in regards to co-cultivation benefits to reduction of ocean acidification, especially critical given effects on shell building? Um. I think the answer to that is yes. Uh, and again, that was the, the kelp grown close to mussels um, example. And so scientists from Bigelow Laboratory for Ocean Sciences, principally, and the Island Institute, which is a local nonprofit, um, they spearheaded that uh, and they found uh, specific changes to ocean chemistry uh, and the benefits to shell, shell strength, uh, particularly in that um, in that example, then the, the term usually used is that there's a halo around the kelp. 
where this change uh, in water chemistry seems to have a strong benefit for bivalves. Excellent. Um, I, I'd love to keep asking questions for hours. Uh, I, unfortunately, I, I think we've uh, we've hit our time limit today, and we want to make sure that everyone can get on to enjoy this uh, unseasonably mild day in yeah, February. I, um, I, I want to say thank you very much to Dana for taking the time to answer questions. We had a lot of questions come in, which is uh, um, fantastic to see and a lot of interest in this. Um, Dana, do you have anything you'd like to uh, wrap up with? Uh, other than to say it was thank you so much. Um, this was a blast to talk with you all and to, to plan for it. Um, good luck to all of you. Do some stuff. Uh, and I would love to be able to meet you in person sometime. <laughs> Thank you very much, Dana. And Amanda, uh, thank you so much uh, to Nova Scotia Community College for partnering with us on this. Uh, anything uh, that you'd like to add? Well, I'm just going to add that as soon as it's possible, Dana, we'd be happy to have you back for a visit. <laughs> You'll your, heart will, donuts. your heart will never leave, I promise. So. <laughs> uh -huh. That, that so now I just want to do a special shout out again to that NSDC class, Julia Farah. I like thank you guys so much for uh, tuning in and to everyone who was with us today. And um, I think I can't wait now for the next the next series, the next videos in the series. It's going to be awesome. Absolutely. To, to echo Dana, get out there and do stuff. Uh, to echo Amanda, uh, uh, the tagline for the island, your heart will never leave. Um, and uh, a little uh, look ahead, please, please uh, keep in mind that this is just session one. Uh, we have several more coming uh, as part of the ocean farming series, uh, some of which we hope to do in person um, at the very least, and, and maybe even most of them. Uh, so we hope to see some of you out for those. We'll try to include virtual options for those that, uh, that'll need that, uh, that accommodation as well. On behalf of the Cape Breton Partnership uh, and our acting president CEO, Tyler Mathis, who was part of today's call. Thank you very much to everyone who attended, everyone who uh, presented, and for all the fantastic questions. Uh, uh, Dana, I feel like I have to tell you all this. There's so many thanks coming into the chat from, I think, almost everyone attending. Amazing. Thank you. Great information. Great session. Thank you very much. Thanks, everyone. Awesome. Thanks. Have a fantastic day.